Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to talk about this attack that has happened on Exchange Online that has been in the headlines where a China-based actor has accessed some of Exchange Online data and exfiltrated it. So we'll just talk about from a high level first what happened. And that is on July 14th, Microsoft put out a blog that reported an attack by a China-based actor that we have dubbed Storm 558. And that threat actor gained access to email accounts affecting approximately 25 organizations, including government agencies, as well as some consumer accounts of individuals that were likely associated with those organizations. And the TLDR version of it is essentially they used a Microsoft account or an MSA from the consumer side token signing key to forge access tokens for a set of victim user consumer and enterprise inboxes. And this allowed them to access the email data from those inboxes. And they were able to exfiltrate unclassified exchange online outlook data from a small number of those accounts. The issue was mitigated in exchange online on June 27th by blocking the use of the key and then full invalidation of the key was done on June 29th, which prevented it to be used in any systems. So bottom line is Microsoft has completed the mitigation of the attack for all customers. So storm five, five, eight, isn't something that's new. If you know anything about Microsoft Threat Intel, we have a bunch of different agencies that we work with, different parts of the company. And by we, as a disclaimer, both Adam and I do work for Microsoft, but the show is not sponsored by Microsoft. We just mentioned that. And so Microsoft does have a whole threat intelligence department that works with nation states we have people who are focused on different geographical areas different government agencies and this storm 508 has popped up before in the threat intels as part of their tactics and procedures and normally they have targeted u.s and european diplomatic economic or legislative governing bodies or individuals connected to Taiwan or the Uyghur geopolitical interests in China. And historically, they have displayed interest in targeting media companies, think tanks, and telecommunication equipment or service providers. This was kind of the first time that they saw it targeting the U.S. government, and that's mainly who was compromised here. The objective for Storm 558 has usually been to obtain unauthorized access to email accounts and they do that through a number of means like credential harvesting phishing campaigns or oauth token attacks this threat actor has displayed a higher than normal interest in oauth applications token theft and token replay against microsoft accounts since august 2021 and the actors are generally pretty technical and they are aware of their targets environments, their logging policies, their authentication requirements and policies and procedures, their tooling and reconnaissance activities suggest that storm five, five, eight is very technically adept, well-resourced and has a in-depth understanding of many of the authentication techniques and applications. So this is not your basic script kitty that is trying to do some sort of, you know, MFA bombing or something like that. These guys are very, very good. I I think that's the really important point here 
is the sophistication of a threat actor like Storm 0558 in that they were able to deploy very novel techniques to gain this level of access. Things that I will say, at least from my perspective, I haven't really seen before or heard about before. And this is where sometimes when we talk about guidance for things that may seem difficult to implement or may seem sometimes even counter to prevailing notions, this is why that's so important is it's not so much paranoia as it is just limiting the possibility of things happening, regardless of the sophistication of a threat actor. When you say, well, you know, maybe they could do this. These are the folks we're talking about when we talk about things that seem relatively unlikely, but possible. Um, when you make it impossible entirely, even the most sophisticated threat actor can't do it. So I guess what I'm beating around the bush at saying, and I'll come out more directly, is we've provided, we did a show about this, Andy, I think uh, four, six weeks ago now, uh, about decoupling your online environments from Microsoft or even third parties from your on-premises environment. So separating cloud and on-premises. And some of that activity is difficult and some of it runs counter to prevailing notion. And I've had really great conversations with customers who've kind of walked me through some of their concerns and the way they do things today and why that might be difficult. And to be clear, that would not have mitigated this specific attack, but I'm just speaking more generally about when we share a new story like this and we talk about an adversary like this, you know, the, my intention is not to scare you and make you think the sky is falling. It's to take that really rational, sober look at these kinds of attacks and figure out what we can do about them. And with very sophisticated threat actors that are very determined, it's going to be difficult to keep them out. And that's where you almost have to get into mitigations where it's not unlikely, it's impossible. And, and that's, that's where some of this guidance goes sometimes. So anyhow, I don't mean to get on the soapbox, although I tend to do that on this show, and that's kind of the point. But when I hear about the level of sophistication here, it is scary. But we just kind of have to take that step back and figure out what control what we can control, right? And sometimes that is uh, taking very well-intentioned guidance, even if it's difficult to implement sometimes. And this was a very targeted attack, too. Very, yes. This was mainly the essentially a China-sponsored actor that attacked the U.S. government. They were looking at a very small subset of accounts. It was mostly the U.S. government. And so you do have to take into account risk, right? Mm -hmm. How at risk is your organization and then implement mitigations based on that. Some things will be more difficult. Um, but in this case, let's continue talking about a little bit more of how this all happened. So yeah. Microsoft began an investigation on June 16th following a customer reported anomaly in exchange online data access. That customer was actually the federal civil, uh, federal civilian executive branch or FCEB. And the FCEB agency around mid June, 2023 observed mail item access events with an unexpected client app ID and app ID in M365 audit logs. So that is a specific event that's generated when licensed users access items within Exchange Online mailboxes using any connectivity protocol from any client. The FCEB agency deemed that this was Suspicious because the observed app ID did not normally access mailbox items in their environment. So this was a well-tuned SOC environment where they knew their baseline and they were able to, and they have audit turned on and they were able to kind of see something was being accessed that was outside of their normal baseline. 
They reported this to Microsoft, and then based on the investigation, Microsoft attributed the activity to Storm 0558 based on prior TTPs, and it was also determined that the access was gained around May 15th. Based on kind of the level of access and how things were being done, at first, the Microsoft analysts were actually worried that an Azure AD enterprise signing key had had been compromised and that the actor was using it to forge authentication tokens. However, during the investigation and an in-depth analysis of the attack, it was discovered that the attacker was forging Azure AD tokens using an acquired Microsoft account or MSA consumer signing key. This was made possible by a validation error in Microsoft code. So that is the whole crux of the issue, the attack, and essentially the zero day that happened here. The use of an incorrect signing key to sign the request allowed the investigation teams to see that the actor's access requests which followed a pattern across both enterprise and consumer systems that it was an obvious indicator that no Microsoft system signing tokens, um, that it was, it was an indicator that uh, no Microsoft system would sign tokens in this way. So based on that, we knew that there was no signing key that had been essentially compromised from an enterprise standpoint, from an Azure AD standpoint. So the signing key that was compromised, it was used to forge a token. And I guess we could kind of talk about token forgery and how that happens. So when tokens, um, authentication tokens, they're generally used to validate identities of entities requesting access to a resource. And in this case, it's email. And these tokens are issued to a requesting entity like a user's browser by an identity provider like Azure AD. And in order to prove authenticity, the identity provider signs the token using a private key. The relaying party validates that token presented by the requesting entity by using a public validation key. So very similar to, you know, PKI. You're just signing it with a private key. You validate it with a public key. And if the signatures are validated, then the key will be trusted by the relaying party. An actor can pr- acquire a private signing key and then use that to create falsified tokens with the valid signature that would be accepted by the relying party. So essentially, you're, you're stealing this, the private key, signing it, and then sending it off, and because you have the key, it is forged. Storm 0558 acquired an inactive MSA consumer signing key and used it to forge authentication tokens for Azure AD Enterprise and MSA consumer to access OWA and Outlook.com. All MSA keys active prior to the incident including the one that the actor acquired, have been invalidated. Azure AD keys were not impacted. The method by which the actor acquired the key is still an ongoing investigation, but the key was only intended for MSA accounts. And because of this validation issue, it was allowed to be used to sign Azure AD tokens. And this issue has been corrected. So again, that is the reason why they were able to use an an MSA signing key to sign an Azure AD token that was never intended to happen, and that was an error in the code. So what I previously was just talking about, you know, kind of comes back here in the sense that one of the concerns we've talked about in the past why we guide against running your your own identity infrastructure on premises is because you're at risk for this attack too. And in fact, we saw many organizations fall victim to attacks just like this in the aftermath of the Solar Gate, the Solar Winds compromise, uh, where those threat actors used that initial foothold from that malicious Solar Winds code, got into your environment, stole your signing keys for your 
tokens you're minting in your on-premises identity infrastructure, and that was often Duo, could have been ADFS as well, um, and then use that to gain privileged access to cloud-based services. So not the same thing as here, again, to be clear, but same concept, same idea in theory. Now, ultimately, ultimately what this comes down to is there's still an investigation on how this threat actor obtained the MSA signing key. That's still something we need to figure out because obviously problematic. We don't want bad guys gaining access to signing keys for Microsoft identity services. So more to come there. The second piece of it is Azure AD should not trust tokens that are intended for the consumer environment, MSA. That has been corrected and has been corrected for all customers. Now, the one benefit, if we're finding a silver lining to all this, and Andy touched on this a moment ago, was because the threat actor used this very novel technique in a way that would never happen under normal circumstances, it made it possible to find any and all instances of this behavior and eradicate all of them. So we're able to very conclusively say this, ha this risk has been fully mitigated. This threat has been fully extinguished. The threat actor has been fully repelled from the environment. So that's a positive thing to come out of this. Obviously, I think all of us as security professionals are interested to continue following this story. And I will say Microsoft has stated in our blog post that we intend to be very transparent about this. I think there have been just acknowledging some commentary in the InfoSec space that they would like to see more transparency. I don't have any insight into if or when that will happen, but I imagine we will see more, especially as some of these investigations complete and more details are able to be shared. So I will say stay tuned, but ultimately what you need to know right now is this is no longer a threat, but it would be helpful to know what can you do to be better protected. And I think CISA um, has shared some guidance that we can pass along. Absolutely. There will be a lot of links for this week's show notes. So take a look at you know, the description of the podcast, wherever you listen, there will be a lot of links, like the links to the blog for Microsoft where we first announced it. There is an updated blog on a complete analysis of the techniques for storm zero five, five, eight. And then I will have the CISA um, recommendations as well, which is very, very good, which we'll go through kind of from a high level right now. And then there will also be links to all of the things that CISA talks about, which they first start off with making sure that you have audit logging enabled. And so this, again, I will have the links to the Microsoft documentation on how to turn on audit logging and Within the documents for CISA, they also link to their Microsoft Exchange Online and Microsoft 365 Minimal Viable Secure Configuration Baseline. Wow, that is a mouthful. Um, but this is actually super interesting because if you go to their Secure Configuration Baseline, it talks about many different things. But one of the things in there is audit logging shall be enabled. And this is for all federal agencies. So this is CISA's guidance for all Microsoft Exchange uh, secure configuration baseline. All federal agencies must have audit logging enabled. By default, Microsoft retains audit logs for 90 days. Activities for users with E5 license are um, is logged for one year. And with CISA's requirements, they actually need like longer than that. It's, I think, 18 months or something like that, hot storage and then longer with cold storage. So if you do need longer, you can do a couple of things. You can either offload the logs and then store them somewhere else, or you can create an audit log retention policy within M365. And there are some options there. You can do seven days, 30 days, six months, nine months, one year, three years, five or seven years. And then there's even a longer like add-on license for audit log retentions where you can go up to 10 years for your audit logs. So this is number one because this is where they found, you know, some of the things that were anonymous based on their activity. 
The second one, uh, in addition to audit logging, is enable purview audit premium logging. This does require licensing at the E5 or G5 for government agencies. and But that, that just is premium logging, which gives you more robust events. Um, I think, if I'm not correct, there was some talk on some of the InfoSec Twitter or Mastodon, all the different things, threads um, that are out now where the mail item accessed events was only available within the premium audit logging. So some of the events you may not be able to see unless you have premium audit logging. Yeah, you're, that's correct. The mail items accessed is a premium audit feature. And I want to touch on this for a moment because there has been some commentary in the InfoSpec's infosec space about this so to be clear this is not something that previously existed in exchange online and then was yanked away and added in a premium tier this was net new capability that was added to the exchange online service for an additional cost if you chose to pay it if you wanted premium audit you could get it and the benefit is this does give you a much higher level of confidence over exactly what items were accessed by either users who should have access or users who shouldn't have access. Um, but it's down to an individual mail item level, regardless of protocol, regardless of client, regardless of anything. So it's a very powerful audit event, extremely noisy, extremely computationally expensive that costs Microsoft money to run that reduces Microsoft's margin. So ultimately some of the cost of that has to be shared by customers, both the research and development to create and enable that new capability as well as the ongoing operationalization of it. So I know there's been some commentary about that feeling like this is pay for play security, which I would say the whole infosec space is pay for play, but Ultimately, this is expensive to operate. If you want this level of auditing, it is available for a nominal fee. Um, and I, I don't think it's anyone just trying to uh, gate everything between a higher tier. It's ultimately, there's a cost to run that service. There's a cost to create and maintain that service. And some of that has to be shared by the customer. So I don't, I, this is not a malicious thing. This was not a, a existing capability that was locked away later. It was, it was new engineering effort. Um, and it's, and it's a very, very, very noisy service. If you can imagine across the millions of exchange online mailboxes, auditing down to an individual mailbox item, every single time it's touched and accessed would be enormously computationally expensive. You have to think of when you operate at cloud scale, and we're talking in the millions and billions and trillions of events, anything, even if it seems relatively small, can add up at that scale. And so this is just one of those things. So not trying to be a Microsoft apologist here, but trying to give equal weight to the whole story. Uh, things like this aren't always easy to just flip on and enable for everyone. And, and then you also have to balance that against Microsoft did do a cost increase on the E3 platform for the first time in essentially the services history, you know, over 10 years of service, um, over basically the last, uh, I believe eight, 12 months or so last 18 months or so. And obviously any cost increase is enormously unpopular. Um, but there had been a lot of new capability added to the service. And of course the cost of operating cloud services has gone up over the last decade with the increases in energy costs and uh, computing hardware costs and people costs and real estate costs and everything else. And so eventually that cost had to be added on too. If Microsoft kept throwing everything into the E3 platform, the costs would increase a lot faster than I think most customers are comfortable with. So the model, instead of throwing everything in there and just raising the cost all the time is allowing organizations to self-select what additional capabilities and features they want. And again, I don't want to sound like an apologist, but I think it's really easy to sit in our InfoSec armchairs and throw shade at cloud providers and act like they should just include everything for free all of the time. 
um, and that's just not economically viable. And I think for most organizations, they actually would not want that because they don't want a the rate of change without their own buy-in, but B, they wouldn't want the rate of cost increase without them being able to choose when and how they want to bear that cost increase. So things to think about, it's, it's not as simple as just give it away to everyone all the time. As much as we would love for everything to be free all the time, there are costs associated with everything and there are trade-offs involved. And, and those decisions aren't always easy. And I will say nobody gets them right, including our employer all of the time. But it's, it's really easy sometimes to take those shots. And in reality, it's a lot harder to balance all those conflicting uh, needs and resources. A couple more things on logs that CISA recommends, making sure that logs are searchable by operators and then enabling Microsoft 365 Unified Audit Logging or UAL. UAL should be enabled by default, but we're basically saying go and validate these settings. And I'll have a link for you to go and check the documentation if you're not sure where to find it. And finally, understand your organization's baselines. This was super important in discovering this activity. So you need to know what your baseline patterns look like. And then when things are abnormal versus normal traffic, you should be able to visualize that. Under general cloud mitigations, I found this to be a very interesting section that CISA talked about. Um, the first thing they talked about was a little bit throwback to our last episode of our podcast where we talked about the shared responsibility model. In this case, the mitigation actions all were responsible for Microsoft to mitigate because it was part of the cloud-based infrastructure. So this was on Microsoft. However, CISA and the FBI have recommendations for critical infrastructure uh, implementations for hardening cloud environments. And while some of these will probably wouldn't have mitigated this particular attack, they will reduce... Um, the impact of less sophisticated malicious activity targeting cloud uh, environments in the future. So a couple of things, they have recommendations for baseline security configurations for all the different Microsoft um, solutions here listed. So Defender for Office 365, Azure Active Directory, which now is called Entra ID, and Exchange Online, OneDrive for Business, so on and so forth. So there'll be links within the documentation to take a look at the security configuration baselines. Another bullet that they have is have separate administrator accounts from user accounts. We've talked about that many, many times. Uh, collect and store your security logs, endpoint solutions, cloud applications, security services, firewalls, DLP systems, all that, and you know, make sure that you have a way to store and collect those. And then use a telemetry hosting solution, interesting way to put it, basically a SIM that aggregates log data um, and telemetry data to allow you to monitor and audit and alert off of that. And then the final bullet, again, this is something that, you know, I love reading through this stuff because it's like, oh, this is something that I would have never thought of. Review contractual relationships with all your cloud service providers and ensure the contracts include security controls the customer deems appropriate, appropriate monitoring and logging of provider-managed customer systems, appropriate monitoring of service provider presence, activities, and connections to the customer networks, and notifications of confirmed or suspected activity. So all of your cloud services, all of your solutions that you implement, make sure that you're reviewing the contracts and understand you know, what's, what that all entails. Yeah. Great guidance here from our friends over at CISA. I, I think, uh, top to bottom, this is, this is spot on. Um, I have not looked through these configuration baselines for some of these services. I'm interested to check that out and maybe we could do a show on it in the future because I'm kind of curious to see that laid out on how they recommend, for example, you configure exchange online. So, um, things I'll be checking out for sure. Um, but overall, yes, make sure your audit logs are enabled end to end audit log, all the things, um, most of these cloud mitigations are good guidance, um, separate administrator and user accounts. That's kind of what I've been getting at earlier. Um, collect everything, store it in different solutions. Yeah. Perfect. 
Uh, I like the call out too about reviewing the contracts with CSPs and seeing what, what is and isn't included and understand the provider's responsibilities versus your responsibilities. This still comes up regularly with customers in that there's sometimes misperceptions or outright confusion over what's Microsoft's responsibility versus what's their responsibility. And you undoubtedly have more cloud service providers than just Microsoft. You may work with ServiceNow or Salesforce or Workday. And so having that clear understanding of what their responsibilities are and what yours are is really, really important as well. And I think it's easy to be like, well, we're in the cloud, they do everything, but that's not how it actually works. So really, really good call out there on making sure you're crisp on what you need to do. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.